Now that we've had an overview of some of the key ways that we study consciousness, as well as some of the basic views on consciousness itself, we're going to move on to our first major topic in the chapter, and this is awareness and attention. Now we can talk about awareness as the ability to directly know and perceive, to feel, or to be cognizant of events. Basically, we're saying that it's when we're being conscious of something. So again, in this chapter, we're finding very uh, circular definitions where when we talk about consciousness, we talk about awareness. When we talk about awareness, we talk about consciousness. Um, but we can also talk about attention, which is a little bit more helpful. And this is the process of selecting the information from our internal and external environments that we end up prioritizing. So we could also talk about it as concentrating our awareness on something to the exclusion of something else. And this kind of makes sense if we think about the fact that we have very limited mental resources. So there are so many things going on both around us and within us that it would be impossible to give absolutely everything our full attention. So we have to choose what do we pay attention to and what do we ignore. So this process of deciding what we attend to can be either a conscious process, our active attention, where you choose to shift your attention to something like, say, a text. Or maybe you're actively searching your surroundings for your keys. That's something that you are aware of and controlling actively. But it can also be an unconscious process. We could call it passive attention. So certain stimuli are just so attention grabbing that they're going to automatically become our focus. So if you think of a fire truck with sirens on, you're going to notice that very, very quickly, not because you are looking for a fire truck, but because it is loud and flashing and red and attention grabbing. We're going to talk a little bit more about what makes certain things attention grabbing um, in just a few minutes here. But first, I just want to talk about the fact that the things that we notice in any given moment can change depending on a lot of background factors. So our current goals will depend or will affect what we are focusing on. So if you're looking for your keys, you are searching for key shaped items in your belongings. But if you're not looking for your keys, then you might ignore them um, while you're looking for something else. Our past experiences are also going to affect what we notice. So if you have experience with something, you're going to get more out of information because you know which specific parts to attend to, as well as your current state of mind. So if you're hungry, you're going to be a lot more likely to notice things that are food related than non-food related. And we should also note that studying attention in the lab is very, very different from studying it in the real world. So in the lab, you're usually having people sort of sit down to do a task. So you're focusing their attention on the thing that you're looking for. In the real world, our attention is going to be directed by our own goals and experience and state of mind, rather than by the instructions given by an experimenter. So we always want to keep those limitations in mind when looking at research. Uh, but we can talk about one of the ways that we can test attention in a lab, and this is the process called shadowing. Or more technically, you could call it a dichotic listening task. Um, and so this would be a situation where you have someone sit, they have heads, uh, headphones on, and one side of the headphones would play one particular message, and the other side of the headphones would play another particular message. And then this shadowing task would be that we ask them to re repeat what is playing on one side um, while ignoring the other side. While people are really, really good at repeating back what they're hearing on one side and sort of blocking out the other side, they're very good at remembering the message that they've repeated, they have a lot more trouble remembering what was on the other side because they weren't actively attending to it. And there's a little bit more to it here because it's not that they completely ignored absolutely everything that was going on on the other side. So they might be able to remember general information like, um, was it a male or a female voice that was speaking? Uh, what did they sound like? Was there a change halfway through the message? Was it partially one person speaking and then partially another person speaking? So it's not that they have absolutely no recall of the stuff they weren't attending to. Um, it's just that they have a lot less information than the stuff that they were focused in. 
And this is actually a great way to transition over to the idea of selective attention, which we've already kind of been talking about, but without actually naming. So selective attention is this focus on one particular kind of information or some stimuli while ignoring other information or other stimuli. So you're choosing what you pay attention to and you're choosing what you ignore. And again, this can be sort of active or passive, but um, we can now start talking about what determines what we actually focus in on. One of the big determinants here is sim stimulus salience. And this is the idea that some stimuli are going to capture our attention just based on their physical properties. So there might be bottom-up qualities in our environment that influence our attention. So if you remember our bottom-up and top down discussion from our sensation and perception chapter, same idea applies here. So these are sort of those small elements within our environment that get put together when we start focusing in on things. So stimulus salience would be things maybe that are biologically relevant. Things like bright colors or strong smells or whatever. Um, and again, we'll talk about some examples in just a couple of slides here. So we have these things that are uh, innately salient to us and they will draw our attention. And when our attention is actually diverted due to this salience of a stimulus, we could call that attentional capture. So if we look at this image here, we have this bright colored flower in the foreground that's so standing out in stark contrast from the rest of the environment. So this is a salient stimulus due to its color and the contrast that we have here. So we could say that there's been attentional capture here due to the color of this image. And so if we wanted to look at, okay, what are those factors that are influencing our attention in these situations? We've already kind of talked about our nature of the stimulus. So we are predisposed to pay attention to those biologically relevant things. We notice things that are new, that are moving, that are high intensity or repetitive, or in stark contrast to their surroundings. So these can be things that are biologically relevant, like we've already said, things that are colorful, uh, relevant for us to pay attention to in the moment. If we're hungry, we see food. Um, if we are walking through a crowd and we see an attractive face, those would all be things that um, draw our attention, actually, which I noted on the next slide. So we can pick out attractive faces. We also tend to notice angry or fearful faces because someone who is angry or someone who is afraid, um, those are reasons that we might also want to be concerned. So if someone's angry, they might be a threat. If someone's afraid, they might be afraid of something. So we would want to see what they're afraid of to make sure that we don't have to worry about it too. All right. Um, so that was the bottom up process, but what a top down process. This is when we start bringing in our learning and experience to help us determine what information we should or should not pay attention to. So the textbook uses the example of um, sort of this beetle versus a ladybug or ladybird, depending on where you learned the term, um, and how they look fairly similar. They both have sort of that reddish coloring and spots, but one of these bites really, really hard and the other one is completely harmless. And so looking at them on the surface, you might not know which is which, especially when you have lots of experience with ladybugs and you realize that their colorings and number of spots and all of that can change pretty dramatically. But once you've experienced these guys, once you've had it pointed out to you, you might realize that their faces are very, very different and the faces stay pretty constant. So that would be something where you've learned from experience that these guys will bite and these ones will not. Um, and this also works for, uh, actually, I have a slide for this. So previous experience, stuff that you are motivated by and things that you have an interest in, as well as the experience in, will influence what you pay attention to. So a botanist will focus in on plants. Architects will pay attention to structures. Those of us who study birds for a living will notice songbirds and listen to bird songs. So there's that sort of predisposition to pay attention to stuff that has meaning to us. And that also ties into personal experience. So something like if you've played a video game for a really long time, you might pick up on hidden rewards. So if you've played, uh, say, the old Pokemon games or even Super Mario, 
There are certain arrangements in the background that make you think there's a hidden item here or a secret passage or a way to get to a part of the level that you usually can't get to. And it might be really hard to describe to someone exactly what features make you think that, but from experience you've learned that when the screen kind of looks like this, I expect something to happen. So our personal experience and what we have exposure to can sort of focus in our attention and make certain things a lot more relevant or salient to us as we're working through. And this would be where the textbook goes back into divided attention, but I already kind of mentioned that, where we had talked about our automatic processing versus controlled or effortful processing. Our text calls it automat uh, automatic which is that fast, effortless processing without conscious thought. Um, I've just called it automatic processing. There are lots of different names for all of these terms, but I figured I'd acknowledge that the textbook doesn't technically use automatic processing as a term. All right, so the next section, um, if you haven't already watched this part of the textbook, there's a lot of sort of interactive videos and stuff. Um, for those who don't have the textbook or haven't done it yet, I would recommend pausing this lecture to watch this YouTube video because it's a really interesting one that helps illustrate our next concept. Um, so you can go and do that if you'd like, but then I'm going to move on and talk about that concept, which is inattentional blindness which I've also seen called inattention blindness. Um, I prefer inattentional. It seems to sound a little bit better. Um, but this is our tendency to miss changes to some kinds of information when our attention is being engaged elsewhere. So in the YouTube video that I linked, that's very similar to one that's in our textbook that gets you to look at a bunch of players playing basketball. And there's a team wearing black and a team wearing white. And they ask you how many passes are made by one team or the other. But while you're focused on counting passes, a task that takes up a lot of your mental resources, there's something else going on in the background that you probably didn't notice the first time you watched it. So this focuses in on the fact that we have stimuli that we don't focus on. It doesn't mean that we're not seeing them at all. Our visual receptors are still picking up that information. It's not that we're completely blind to it, but that information is not entering our consciousness. So we see it, but we don't know that we see it. So it's blindness or not seeing specifically due to not paying attention. Um, and this can happen with auditory signals as well. It's just a lot easier to visualize with our visual signals. And researchers have developed tons of interesting studies to try and look at um, this inattentional blindness, things that we do or don't notice. There are some really great, I think they're from BBC videos, that show uh, change blindness and change detection, where they'll have individuals uh, approach people on the street, hold up a map and ask for directions. And then they'll have, say, construction workers walk by with a big plank of plywood and block, walk right between the person on the street that they've stopped to ask for directions and the experimenter. And they'll switch out the person who is asking for directions. So they'll come back holding a map, but it's a completely different person. And the individual on the street that they were asking most of the time doesn't notice the change. So we have this change blindness um, where they assume that nobody has changed, nothing has gone on. And this can be really dramatic. They can have um, the experimenter person could be someone of a completely different appearance, different hair color, different skin color, different anything. Um, and, and the person being asked for directions most of the time still will not notice that a change has occurred. Um, and this inattention is really tied up in the idea of sort of inhibition, where we actively reduce processing on some information while attending to a particular task. So while we're focused in on reading a map, we are inhibiting all other irrelevant stimuli. But this is also what something like street magic, uh, magicians, whether they're, I guess, even whether they're on the stage or on the street, they use this, they distract and draw your attention away so that they can do something that you're not aware of. So they kind of buy into this idea of tension and inhibition and focusing your awareness somewhere else by misleading or misdirecting your attention. So it's a very interesting topic to look into. 
On the topic of cool concepts, we can move on to talk about subliminal and subconscious messages. So you've probably heard about subliminal messaging, where something is hidden in, uh, say, a piece of media. Say you're watching a movie and there's a hidden subliminal message. Or, or uh, in advertising is one of the big ones that people talk about. But let's actually look at the science behind this. So a subliminal stimulus is a sensory stimulus that is processed, but doesn't actually reach the threshold for conscious perception. So it's something that we have in our senses, so something that we see or hear, feel or whatever. Though, again, it's a lot easier to think about this with um, sort of sub-visual messages, and those are the ones related to our visual system. So they're um, things that we are seeing but not being aware that we're seeing. And we can also have sub-audible messages, so same thing but with audio stim uh, stimuli. And so usually what happens with visual stimuli, it's something that's presented too quickly for our brain to be aware of. So our sensory receptors in our eyes would pick up on that visual information, but it wasn't around long enough for us to actively process it and do anything with it. So it doesn't enter into our conscious awareness. It just sort of sticks around in that um, not quite yet relevant information category. And with our sub-audible messages, these are auditory stimuli that are presented too quickly for the brain to perceive, or that are just outside of our ability to pay attention to. Um, and this is sort of an interesting concept, and there was actually a really big uproar um, quite a few years back, quite, quite a few years back, um, when it came out that subliminal messaging was a thing. And there was an original study, I believe, that was done in a movie theater where they were trying to show that they could influence moviegoers into buying concessions. So they set up a study, and in some uh, theaters, they would have messages that they should go and drink uh, Coca-Cola. And then in other theaters, they didn't include that subliminal messaging. And they reported that there was a 50 plus percent increase in concession sales in those theaters that had that subliminal message. And so when this paper was put out, there was massive uproar because everyone was so concerned that advertising companies would start sort of dictating what people were spending their hard earned money on that we would be brainwashed in our homes um, and all of our advertisements and movies and everything would be sort of convincing us to spend our money on things that we didn't necessarily want or need. Um, and so it got to the point that there were actually laws put in place that banned the use of subliminal messaging. And to this day, those bans are still in place in the UK, at least the last time I checked they were. Um, the problem with this is that it came out uh, it came to light after the fact that that study was completely fabricated and there wasn't a significant increase in concession sales. And further follow-ups on this kind of messaging when we look more into it and when we control very, very tightly in a lab setting, we end up finding that a lot of these, uh, a lot of these subliminal messages have no effect whatsoever. Some of them even go so far as to have the opposite effect, where if there isn't something overtly eye-catching and attention-grabbing in the advertisement, it becomes even less noticeable um, because people then just immediately skim over it. But there's been tons of research on this to the point that it's no longer illegal to have subliminal messaging in North America simply because the effect of subliminal messaging is almost negligible. There have been some studies, this is beyond what's in the textbook, but there's some studies that have been able to look at um, if you have a situation where, say, somebody is already really, really thirsty and you have a subliminal message that shows them uh, some kind of soda pop versus just water, you can bias their choice of beverage away from water towards the soda, but it's... Uh, it's not necessarily reliable, and it was a very, very small amount of influence. So our take home from subliminal messaging after decades of study is that subliminal messages are not really an effective way of advertising. 
you're a lot better off just putting up a giant billboard that catches people's attention and makes them notice it um, rather than trying to rely on something like sublimit messaging. For our last few slides in this section, I want to talk about a couple of different disorders of attention. So the first are some uh, disorders of visual attention. So this would be called neglect. And it's basically where individuals suffer some kind of brain damage, usually lesions on their right parietal lobe, um, or it could be on the left and we can have the opposite, but um, it's a lot easier to study with the right parietal lobe. Um, and neglect basically means that they are not aware of their left visual field stimuli. So things on the left side of their body almost cease to exist. So when, actually I have an image of this, so if we have a model shown to these people who have that neglect, visual neglect, they would draw only half of the image. They ignore half of what they're seeing. And this can also happen with things like when they shave. Um, when they shave their face, they might completely ignore the left side of their face because to them it doesn't register as something that needs attention. And so this neglect leads to some very interesting drawings here. So they think that they've labeled this circle, but they really haven't. But I guess the even cooler part is that patients aren't aware of stimuli that are presented in that left visual field, but they can be influenced by it. So if they showed a participant who has this visual neglect, um, if they showed them two images of houses, and the images, actually, I have houses right here. So if we had, say, two images of this house, one that was perfectly normal, and then one that looked like it was on fire, but only on the left side, the side that the individual with neglect would probably ignore, we can ask them which house they'd prefer to live in. And if they were completely ignoring and not getting any information from that left side, there should be even odds of them selecting the house that is just normal and the house that's on fire. But instead they find that they would be a lot more likely to want to live in the house that is not on fire. Even though if they were asked to draw the house that was on fire, they wouldn't include the fire. Um, so they aren't aware of the stimuli that are on that left visual field, but can still be influenced by it in some way. So a very interesting process, and they're not quite sure how that's happening. Um, but of course, there's going to be a lot more research looking into it, I'm sure. Um, and then we can, of course, talk about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD. Um, and this would be an issue with attention, among other things. Um, this is one of those concepts that is a lot more complicated than what most people's sort of general knowledge of it are. This is one of the most commonly diagnosed psychological problems, especially in North America. Of course, our text focuses on the U.S., but that's fine. Um, and it's sort of characterized or paid attention to because the children tend to display uh, difficulty in focusing their attention. So attention deficit is that part of it. There's a lot more to ADHD than just lack of focus and lack of being able to attend to things for long periods of time. But because that seems to be one of the most detrimental components of the disorder, that's what a lot of people focus in on. Um, that's sort of my own little two cents on the topic. Um, but this is something that uh, we're not, again, not quite sure exactly why it always happens. And there are uh, sort of different driving factors going on, and we could spend a lot more time talking about this in, say, a brain uh, course or a brain disorders type course. Um, but we do know that we have some successful treatment through medication and training programs. So if we can sort of, um, well, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, but if we provide different kinds of medication and different kinds of training to help sort of overcome those impulses to focus on something else, if we can get over that impulsivity, then we can kind of get back to focusing and paying more attention on different topics. But it isn't always as clear cut as that. Um, but I'm not going to go into tons of detail 